Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 29 of time series modeling and forecasting. So far the, we have considered uh, different stationary ARMA processes or non-stationary ARIMA processes, autoregressive integrated moving average processes. The ARMA processes usually have short memory, short memory in the sense that their auto correlations uh, decline very rapidly. As you in increase the lag, the auto correlations decline. So, those processes have short memory. On the other hand, uh, non stationary ARIMA processes have infinite memory. So, they have very long memory or in fact infinite memory. And then if you integrate ARIMA processes to make them stationary, then they again become short memory ARMA processes. Now, in practice in many economic time series, it has been observed that the time series has long memory. So, to model those time series, uh, neither the one can use ARMA processes, because ARMA processes have short memory, nor one can use ARIMA processes, because ARIMA processes have infinite memory. For that purpose, you require some alternative model. And these uh, uh, auto regressive fract fractionally integrated moving average processes provide an alternative to model the time series which have long memory. You may uh, model both kind of time series, the persistent or anti-persistent. Anti-persistent means the time series where uh, say an increase is followed by a decrease. So, uh, if your time series has long memory, then you can use auto regressive fractionally integrated moving average processes. So, these are actually long memory or persistent models. So, as I mentioned earlier, ARMA models are able to capture short range dependence and the dependence between time series observations decreases rapidly as the time lag increases because uh, the auto uh, correlations uh, decline very rapidly with the lag. Then you have integrated processes, those processes have infinite lag memory and then the process reduces to a stationary process with short range dependence after the finite number of differences. So, non-stationary processes have their own problems uh, and then those processes have uh, infinite memory also. And you, if you try to make them stationary, then you get a process which has again short memory. Now, the order of differencing for the autoregressive integrated moving average processes 
is an integer. So, suppose you differentiate the series once, you have random walk model, you differentiate the series one, you get purely random process. So, order of integration is 1. So, usually it is an integer. Now, in practice, many economic time series show long range dependence, and uh, these are called long memory or long range persistence. Then, ALMA processes fail to model the long memory phenomena present in a time series as their ACF decays exponentially, it decays very rapidly. Then the ACF of autoregressive fractionally integrated moving average process decay much lower than the exponential decay. So, this is the beauty of these fractionally integrated processes. Their ACF decays very slowly. And uh, then uh, they are not like uh, integrated processes which have infinite memory. So, this property of uh, autoregressive fractionally integrated moving average process make them a strong candidate for modeling time series having long memory. Then these fractionally integrated processes provide much improved fit and better predictions in comparison to ALMA processes for such kind of time series which have long memory. Now, first we define fractionally integrated noise or auto regressive fractionally integrated moving average process of order 0 t 0. Again just like ARIMA processes here this first number denotes the order of the auto regressive term this d denotes the order of the fractional integration term and this 0 denotes the order of the moving average term. So, in general if you write a r f i m a p d q process then it means the order of the auto regressive term is P, order of moving average term is Q and order of fractional integration term is D. So, here we are considering only processes which have fractionally integrated integration term D. These processes do not have any auto regressive term or moving average term. So, these processes are called fractionally integrated noise. So, the process y t is a fractionally integrated noise or fractionally integrated ALMA process of order 0 0 and uh, we take d lying between minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. If y t is a stationary solution of 1 minus b to the power d y t equal to u t. or y t is generated by this process. Now, if you take d equal to 1, well uh, it is not possible here for fractionally integrated processes, but suppose you write d equal to 1, then you get simple random walk model, which is a non-stationary process. Uh, these uh, fractionally integrated processes use a fraction here instead of 1 it has used d here.
and this d we take between minus 0 0.5 to plus 0 0.5 to and for this range of d the process we will show it that the process is stationary also. Here u t is a white noise process, this process is denoted by a r f i m a 0 d 0 process. Now, for the day line between minus 0 0.5 to 0.5, we define the difference operator 1 minus b to the power minus t as 1 minus b to the power minus t equal to summation j equal to 1 0 to infinity psi j b to the power j where psi j is equal to gamma j plus t upon gamma j plus 1 gamma t which is equal to product i equal to 0 to j i minus 1 plus t upon i j equal to 0 1 so on. So, uh, using this expansion we can write the process as y t equal to 1 minus b to the power minus t u t and then we use this expansion and then you can easily verify this result. A stationary solution for one is y t equal to summation j equal to 0 to infinity psi j u t minus j. You simply take this expansion and then b to the power j u t is equal to u t minus j. Now, you derive the spectral density function for the fractionally integrated process f y omega is equal to sigma square u upon 2 pi mod 1 minus e to the power minus i omega to the power minus 2 d. In your process is y t is equal to 1 minus b to the power minus t u t, u t is a purely random process. So, now you can easily verify that the spectral density function for this or you can also write f y omega in this form 1 minus e to the power minus i omega into 1 minus e to the power plus i omega. You take product of these two and then you take to the power half and then you take again whole to the power minus 2 d and you multiply it by sigma square u upon 2 pi which is the spectral density function of this purely random process. And then 1 minus e to the power minus i omega into 1 minus e to the power plus i omega is equal to 1 minus e to the power i omega plus e to the power minus i omega plus one. So you have two minus two cos omega and then you can write it as 2 1 minus cos omega is equal to 2 times sin square omega by 2 and then you have one more 2 here. and then we take to the power half. So, you get 2 times sin omega by 2 here yeah. and for the a small omega as omega tends to 0 sin omega by 2 tends is approximately equal to omega by 2. So, you can approximate f omega by sigma square u upon 2 pi omega to the power minus 2 d. 
So, from here you verify that f y omega is finite for all values of omega only when d is less than or equal to 0. Otherwise, as omega turns to 0, this term will create problem because you have negative power here. This term will tend to infinity. So, if d is greater than 0, then this uh, spectral density function uh, will not exist, it will create problem. Again, the expression for gamma k is equal to gamma 1 minus 2 d gamma k plus t upon gamma 1 minus t gamma d gamma k minus t plus 1 sigma square u. Uh, I will give you the derivation of this gamma k at the end of this lecture. So, and for gamma and for k equal to 0, you get gamma 0 here and then you can easily derive the expression for rho k. So, rho k is equal to gamma 1 minus t gamma k plus t upon gamma d gamma k minus t plus 1 and you can also write it in this product forms product i equal to 0 to k i minus 1 plus t upon i minus t. Now, we use the Stirling's formula which is given here as x tends to infinity, you can approximate gamma x by under root 2 pi e to the power minus x plus 1, x minus 1 to the power x minus half. And then we utilize this Stirling's formula. So, the expression for psi j is this, in this expression you just approximate this term using the Stirling's formula and then you approximate this term using the Stirling's formula. Means here uh, in the numerator you have j plus t. So, in place of x you write j plus t and in the denominator you have j plus 1. So, in place of x you write j plus 1 and then finally you obtain j to the power minus t minus 1 upon gamma minus t. Then uh, rho k can be approximated uh, just by using this Stirling's formula, you can also approximate rho k and the uh, approximation is this gamma 1 minus t upon gamma d k to the power 2 d minus 1. Now, you observe that if d is approximately equal to 0 0.5, then rho k decays very slowly and the process has long memory. And uh, then if d is uh, approximately equal to minus 0 0.5, then rho k decays faster. Means here you have a term k to the power 2 d minus 1. So, from here you can easily observe this phenomenon. Now, a long memory process is a stationary process with the rho k approximately equal to c k to the power 2 d minus 1. c is not equal to 0 if d is less than 0 0.5. And uh, then for d less than 0, summation k equal to minus infinity to plus infinity mod of rho k is finite and process is a intermediate memory process. If d lies between 0 and 0 0.5, then summation k equal to minus infinity to plus infinity mod of rho k is equal to infinity and the process is a long memory process. Again, you can easily verify this phenomena using this approximation. 
So, if d is greater than 0, then you have positive power here. So, as k increases, this term keeps on increasing. And in that case, this series diverges. In summation, mod of rho k also diverges. So, process is a long memory process. We also define anti persistent time series. Uh, in an anti persistent time series or mean reverting time series, an increase will most likely be followed by a decrease or vice versa. So, the time series actually returns to its mean. Means uh, if at some point of time it is above the mean, then at the other point of time it is more likely that the time series is below the mean. Such kind of time series is called anti persistent time series. Uh, I also define Hurst exponent. This is an index of long range dependence. So, for measuring long range dependence, uh, this Hurst exponent is uh, often used or it is used for measuring long term memory of the time series. And uh, actually this measure was developed in hydrology for determining optimum dam sizing for the Niels reverse rain and drop conditions. So, this is the origin of uh, this measure of long range dependence Hurst exponent. It was originally developed uh, to determine the optimum dam sizing for the Niels river. So, suppose y t is an observed time series t equal to 1 to n and it has sample mean y bar n sample variance s square n. Then mean adjusted partial sums are defined as say z t is equal to summation j equal to 1 to t y j minus t times y bar t. So, z t's are the mean adjusted partial sums. Then adjusted range r n is defined as maximum of z 1, z 2, z n minus minimum of z 1, z 2, z n means range of z s. Then these scaled adjusted ranges are then upon s n. Then again I am skipping the proof of this result, but expected value of r n upon s n is proportional to n to the power h as n tends to infinity. Now, if uh, your time series is I, IID, it does not have any autocorrelation, then h is uh, equal to 0 0.5. Uh, so, h is known as Hurst exponent, it is also called Hurst coefficient and for large n log of R n upon S n is equal to alpha plus h log of n. Well, from here you can easily observe that log of expected value of R n upon S n is say suppose you take some constant here expected value of R n upon S n equal to some constant time n to the power h. So, log of that constant C say plus h times log of n and you write this equal to alpha. Or log R n upon S n is approximately equal to alpha plus h log n. So, 
if you want to estimate h, then estimation of h is just equivalent to estimating the slope of regression between log R n upon S n and log n. So, to estimate h, estimate of h is the slope of regression between log of least scaled adjusted range and log of n. So, it is very simple, just calculate the readjusted uh, range then you obtain the log of this R n upon S n. You have a constant alpha here, h here, then you have log n here. And then you just take, uh, uh, you, you just run regression between these two quantities and obtain the least square estimator of h. On the basis of the value of h, you can decide whether your process has long memory or not or whether it is stationary or not. So, if h lies between 0.5 to 1, then it is a long memory process. So, long memory structure exists. If h is greater than or equal to 1, then this implies that the process has infinite variance and it is a non-stationary process. And if h lies between 0 to 0.5, then the process is anti-persistence, means the process is mean reverting or you can say that anti-persistence structure exists in the process. So, if at time t the process is above the mean, then at time t plus 1 it is more likely that the process takes value below the mean. This property is called the anti-persistence or mean reverting. For h equal to 0.5, the process is a white noise process. Then long range persistence is usually characterized by uh, instead of an exponential decaying ACR. Remember in ARMA processes, the ACF decays exponentially means rho k is approximately equal to or you can say rho k is of order you have a constant here r to the power k, r lies between 0 and 1. Here the ACF decays hyperbolically with k. that is rho k is approximately c k to the power alpha, alpha is greater than 0. In fact, alpha is equal to 2 d minus 1. So, instead of exponential decay like in ARMA processes, you have an hyperbolical decay rho in fractionally integrated processes. Then the spectral density function increases without bound as the frequency tends to 0. This phenomena you also observe using the approximation for the spectral density function. Then the rescaled adjusted range is behaving as a function n to the power h h is greater than half. Now, we define fractionally integrated ARMA or R FEMA processes. So, suppose y t is generated by a stationary process 1 minus b to the power d y t equal to x t. And then this x t follows a stationary ARMA process phi b x t is equal to theta b u t. 
and d lies between minus 0.5 to 0.5. Phi b is a polynomial of order d p in backward shift operator b, theta b is a polynomial of degree q in b, u t is a white noise process. Then we say that y t has fractionally integrated alma or our FEMA process. And the order of the process is P D Q and we denote it by our FEMA P D Q. So, this P is the auto A R term, Q is M A term, order of M A term and D is order of fractional integration term. Uh, remember in ALIMA processes, say if you have say ALIMA P R Q process, then after taking R differences the process becomes a stationary alma process. Here R is an integer, whereas uh, in fractionally integrated processes this D is a fraction. And after taking these t differences, although d is a fraction, you get a process x t, which is a stationary alma process. Then you can write the process it as phi b 1 minus b to the power d y t equal to theta b u t. Again, the process is stationary if roots of phi z equal to 0 lie outside the unit circle and process is invertible is if the roots of theta z equal to 0 lie outside the unit circle. Then we can also obtain the spectral density function of the process. Uh, when you difference the process d times, it gives you a stationary process x t. So, suppose f x omega is the spectrum of x t, then uh, the spectrum of y t is f y omega is equal to 1 minus e to the power minus i omega mod of this to the power minus 2 d f x omega. Further, x t has alma p q process, stationary alma p q process. So, the spectrum of x t is f x omega is equal to sigma square u upon 2 pi mod theta e to the power minus i omega upon mod phi e to the power minus i omega. Uh, omega lies between minus pi to pi. So, finally you obtain f y omega equal to sigma square u upon 2 pi mod theta e to the power minus i omega upon mod phi e to the power minus i omega mod 1 minus e to the power minus i omega to the power minus 2 d and omega lies between minus pi to pi. So, you obtain this final expression for the spectral density function of y. Now, if omega is small, then you can approximate e to the power minus i omega. If omega is very small, then in
theta you can approximate it by similarly in phi you can approximate it by 1 and then you have a term 1 minus e to the power minus i omega to the power minus 2 d. This is equal to 1 minus we expand it. So, we get 1 minus i omega and then we ignore the higher order terms because higher order terms have omega square, omega q and so on. So, this is approximately equal to i omega. Then mod of this is approximately equal to omega. So, you get omega to the power minus 2 d here. So, the spectral density is approximately equal to a constant. This is a, we write this quantity as c omega to the power minus 2 d. Then auto covariance function for d equal to 0, one obtains the short memory alma process. which is quite obvious for d equal to 0, you simply get alma process. For d lying between 0 to 0.5, the resulting process is a stationary long memory process. And then if d lies between 0 to point minus 0 0.5, the process has a spectral density which vanishes at frequency 0 and is anti persistent. So, if you take d lying between 0 to minus 0 0.5, then d is negative minus 2 d is positive then. Then as omega tends to 0, f y omega vanishes. And the process is anti persistent in the sense that it is mean reverting. Now, we consider the uh, estimator of uh, differencing parameter d given by Gewek and uh, Porter Hurek. Uh, suppose uh, yt follows uh, auto regressive fractionally integrated moving average process of order p d q. So, 1 minus b to the power d y t is equal to x t and then x t follows alma p q process with this spectral density. Then f x omega is bounded and continuous on minus pi to pi. Further, f y omega is equal to mod 1 minus e to the power minus i omega to the power minus 2 d f x omega. And then we have already derived this expression. Uh, this is equal to 4 sin square omega by 2 to the power minus t f x omega. You have taken this 2 inside. So, you get 4 times sin square omega by 2. Now, suppose i n omega j is equal to 1 upon 2 n pi summation y t e to the minus i omega j t, then we take mod of this square. So, this is actually i n, I n omega j is the p the autogram at frequency omega j, where omega j is equal to 2 pi j upon n. And then we have considered total m frequencies. Now, we take log of equation 13. 
So, you get log of f y omega equal to log of f x 0 minus t log of sin square omega by 2 plus log of f x omega upon f x 0. In fact, we have added log of f x 0 here and then we have subtracted log of f x 0. So, that is why we have taken f x 0 in the denominator here. Uh, again in 14 we replace omega by the Fourier frequency omega j and then we add log of i n omega j on both the sides. So, finally, we obtain log of i n omega j equal to log f x 0 minus t times log cosine square omega y 2 plus log i n omega j upon f x omega j plus log f x omega j upon f x 0 you can easily verify it. Then uh, this last term is negligible, so you just ignore this term and then you rewrite it in regression form. So, you write this left hand side equal to y j, then you have the constant term alpha plus beta nu j plus epsilon j, where y j is equal to log i n omega j v j is equal to log 4 sin square omega j by 2 epsilon j is log i n omega j upon f x omega j. Alpha is equal to log f x 0 and beta is equal to minus t. So, your problem reduces to just estimating a linear regression and then you can apply least square procedure for estimating beta here and once you estimate beta you get estimator of d. Uh, we are also assume that m is a function of n such that m by n tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. Then the least square estimator of d is d hat equal to minus times this quantity. So, simply we have applied least square procedure to that regression, we have estimated beta and then uh, the estimator of d is equal to minus times the estimator of beta. And once we estimate d 1 minus b to the power d y t is equal to x t, this follows alma p q process. And then you can easily estimate the parameters of this alma p q process, because this is a stationary invertible process. And then it has been observed that h is equal to d plus half. So, once you have estimated d, you can estimate Hertz coefficient h also. So, h hat is equal to d hat plus half. Uh, just I gave you the derivation of ACVF gamma k also we have gamma k equal to summation j equal to 0 to infinity psi j u t minus j, summation j equal to 0 to infinity psi j u t plus k minus j. And then just take product of these two and since you are taking expectation only those terms appear which have is, is squares of u t minus j. all other cross product terms will have expectation 0, because u t is a purely random process. So, you get expectation of this term equal to sigma square u summation j equal to 0 to infinity psi j psi j plus k. And then we substitute the values of psi j and psi j plus k. Now, here actually I am using uh, this is a special function, confluent hypergeometric function. We represent this infinite series or we write this infinite series in terms of this confluent hypergeometric function. And then we know that this confluent hypergeometric function 
has a specific value. We substitute the value of this confluent hypergeometric function here and then finally, we get this expression. Now, how we get the value of this confluent hypergeometric function? So, we have used these results. This is the expression for the confluent hypergeometric function, where a j denotes gamma a plus j upon gamma a, which is called Pockheimer symbol. And then, if you take z equal to 1 here, then 2 f 1 a b c 1 is equal to gamma c gamma c minus a minus b upon gamma c minus a gamma c minus b. Now, this is the result which we have used in the previous slide. Uh, in the previous slide, we require the value of this to f 1 d k plus t k plus 1 1 and using this result, the value of this uh, special function is gamma k plus 1 gamma 1 minus 2 d upon gamma k minus t plus 1 gamma 1 minus t. Uh, for demonstration purpose, we have simulated 1000 observations from autodegressive fractionally integrated moving average process of order 1.21. So, this differencing parameter d is equal to 0.2 and then the time series has auto regressive term of order 1 moving average term of order 1. Then we have taken phi equal to 0.4 and theta equal to 0.4. This is the plot of the observed sample. And then we have fitted the model. Then these are the estimators and corresponding standard errors. Uh, so, this is the estimate of phi corresponding standard error, estimator of theta corresponding standard error, and then it has estimated the value of d also with this much standard error. Then uh, estimator of sigma square u is this. <coughs> and then we have also plotted the ACF and PACF of the drawn sample. Uh, you observe that uh, you have significant values of ACF up to this point and then we have plotted the PACF for auto regressive fractionally integrated moving average process. In fact, we have drawn these the ACF and PACF for the sample which we obtained from the process. So, um, autoregressive fractionally integrated moving average processes which we have discussed in this lecture provide uh, a tool for modeling economic time series which have long memory. Remember that uh, neither autoregressive moving average processes now, auto regressive integrated moving average processes can provide a proper fit to such models. In fact, uh, the ARMA processes have short memory, short memory in the sense that the ACF of ARMA processes decays very rapidly. So, obviously, the processes do not have long memory and uh, these processes should not be used for modeling the economic time series which have long memory. Further, autoregressive integrated moving average processes 
have long memory, but their memory is infinite. So, they have an infinite memory. Again, you also face some problems in handling non stationary processes. So, in fact, uh, one prefers a stationary process to model a time series even if the time series has a long memory. And then one of the option is these fractionally integrated processes. These processes are not only stationary, so there is no problem of non-stationarity and these processes are also having long memory. So, it uh, these processes resolve both the problems, a stationary process having long memory. So, one must go for uh, these processes when one has to model such kind of economic time series, long memory time series. These processes can uh, model both kind of time series, both kind of long memory time series, which have pers uh, persistent time series as well as anti persistent time series. Anti persistent or mean reverting time series. So, uh, now I am going to stop here. Thank you. Hello everybody, welcome back and here I am to give a preview very short obviously in the area of what we mean by operation research and optimizations. So, we know operation research and optimization is used generally where you have some resources and you want to utilize them in the best possible way considering what your main objective is. Now, if we stop here and, and go back. In the past, so the obvious question comes where from where did this this technique of operation research and optimization which is uh, an area of mathematical techniques come into the existence. So, generally even though the work has started from from areas of mathematics economics, but generally it is considered that operation research and optimizations were very heavily used and it became popular during world war two in trying to schedule different resources, manpower, armaments considering they were resource constraints, time constraints and space constraints and so on and so forth. Now, for the general public it should be aware that uh, we consider from the academic point of view there are different people, very famous people who have worked, but George Jan Danzig is considered the father who really pr proposed the technique of linear programming as a very nice tool where you can use operation research techniques in order to optimize the, the, the resources which are there depending on different constraints which you have. And after that things have really moved very fast, they have been developing throughout the world, they have been usage, they are different type of societies so on and so forth. And in course of time we see and we, we still uh, find exciting areas or application, but theoretically there has been a, a, a growth in techniques like robust optimization, stochastic optimization, dynamic programming, parametric programming, nonlinear programming, so on and so forth and they are used depending on the concept and the areas of application which we see for either finance, for marketing, for scheduling, for, for engineering field and so on and so forth. 
Now, application of o OR and optimization is somebody asks is a very difficult question to answer because if I start now, it will almost take about one hour to give you all, all the, the areas of application of optimization and operation research are. But to keep it very brief, considering that you are all ready and eager to take that as a subject, I will just um, highlight the areas of applications, some of which are in scheduling, in assignment problem, in facility location, like you want to build up a factory, you want to build up some storehouse, so on and so forth. It is used in network flows, like you want to transport some goods, transport manpower from one area to another area. So, how we will try to basically do it in the best possible way. What is best would obviously depend on how you are trying to use optimization as a tool in different areas. It can be used operation research and optimization can be used in health services, in financial portfolio management, asset liability management, game theory and so on and so forth. Now, in the recent past, even though it is very well known, but still I would like to highlight the point that the computing powers and the techniques of operation research and obviously in statistics has exponentially grown. And with, with very sophisticated um, programming being available, like we know that there is MATLAB, there is R, there is SAS, which are different type of optimization tools. We see nowadays that operation research and optimization is also used in health sciences, in gene replication theory, in, in area of say for example, prediction of weather, in the area of say for example, prediction of earthquake, how you find out the best possible way to take um, actions such that it meets your overall demand. Say for example, in, in, in prediction of earthquakes, you would like to basically um, build up your, your houses, build up the dams, build up the overall locations of people staying in different localities in such a way that the minimization of the losses are sustained. Furthermore, after the advent of computing and advent of different techniques, we see many meta heuristic and heuristic techniques are very heavily used in in, in, in parlance of operation research and optimization by joining them together such that you get the ben best benefit. So, if the question arises what are the meta heuristic techniques, I would again be very brief because again there is a huge amount of literature, huma, huge amount of application areas, huge amount of research which, we, which are being done in the area of genetic algorithm, taboo search, ant colony optimization, simulated handling then in the area of particle swarm optimization, in the area of artificial immune system and so on and so forth. In the coming years, it is thought and definitely with, with uh, some uh, positive viewpoint that the area of multi criteria decision making and multi objective programming, where you use different type of tools and use the different advancement of optimization which has been made in such a way that you can basically optimize two different const, um, objective functions which are there in front of you such that either if considering the area of finance, you can either maximize your return for the portfolio or minimize the risk also or say for example, you want to basically have a layout such that minimization of cost is one factor and the maximization of say for example, benefit which accrues to different type of users in this, in this um, overall layout can be attained at the same time. So, obviously, it means that what we are seeing is a huge application of optimization along with different type of computing and, and, and um, heuristic techniques such that in years to come, this area of optimization would become one of the best tools where you accrue and get the benefits in the best possible way. And I am sure that the students or the participants who will take this course will find it an exciting add on to their CVs and, and to their curriculum vitae such that they can understand the techniques, how they can be used in the best possible practical sense. Thank you.